Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I caught the end of the last talk, so this is going to be about the polar opposite of that. Um, so I hope you guys bear with me, but I think this will be a really fun way to end our day here at Alumni College. So um, my last name is Bieberdorf, so you are really close to that. Uh, but it, for those of you who are big Justin Bieber fans, that's just how you say it, Bieberdorf. But thank you so much for that introduction. It was absolutely perfect. Um, so today what I'm going to talk to you about is what I do here at the University of Texas. And so I have two main roles. I'm an educator and I'm also a um, pyromaniac. And so what I'm doing is going to try to tell you how I personally have combined the two to A, to try to excite our undergraduate students, but also to kind of give you a clue of how education has changed. Because I graduated, like you said, in 08, so I am 32. I have, this is my 10th year out of um, undergraduate. And my general chemistry classroom here at UT is very, very, very different from the classroom I personally had at University of Michigan 10 years ago. So what I'm going to do is kind of highlight a couple of those differences and tell you the theory behind that. And then obviously, because it's the last show of the day, we're going to play with some fire, some dry ice, liquid nitrogen, and just kind of have some fun before the reception. So just really quickly to give you a little bit of background about myself, this is usually what I'm known for. If you talk to my students, that's what they're going to describe as I like to breathe fire. I'm going to try to do that for you later, but we're going to see. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Um, but obviously, I didn't come out of the womb that way. If I did, that would be a disaster. So I'm actually um, from Michigan, Kalamazoo originally, and I was born and raised by these two fantastic people. I need to give a shout out to both my mom, uh, my mom, Teresa, and my dad, Craig. I just am showing this picture because this was a year ago. Their dream has been to go to Hawaii forever, and they just got their trip in last year. So they're only happy because um, they're out of Michigan. So <laughs> do you get that? There you go. OK, I was like, some of you understood that. Yeah, it's cold up there, y'all. I, I drove from Texas, and I can't, I can't ever go back. Um, here's a really quick shot of my high school. It didn't look like that when I was there, of course. But I need to highlight this lady. This is Mrs. Kelly Palsrock. She's my idol. She's my mentor. She's my, one of my favorite people in the world. So what she did when I was at 15 years old or a sophomore in high school, she ran around the, chem uh, the classroom with light stuff on fire, and she was just so contagious, and she loved chemistry, and everything she did was about t trying to get us excited and engage in the classroom. And so that's kind of who I look up to and what I try to replicate in my own classroom. Um, like he said, I went to the University of Michigan for my bachelor's, both in chemistry and German. Really? I can try. <laughs> I am a fast talker, and I apologize. I was trying to get through the boring part, um, but I can take it down a notch for you. OK. Um, I went to the University of Michigan, where I got my bachelor's degree in both chemistry and German, like he said. And then I went to the Goethe Institute, where I just did a brief stint in Freiburg, Germany, to try to learn and master the language in German. I'm really grateful for that, because in about two weeks, I have an international company coming from Germany. And they're going to do a whole shoot on us. They're doing a whole thing in Texas and highlighting a bunch of different people. And I'm one of them, and I'm super excited about that because I might be able to actually use my German language. Um, but once I graduated from the University of Michigan, I came down to this fantastic place, the University of Texas. And I spent about five years under these two gentlemen trying to study um, several different catalysts that were active for the suzuki mirar cross-coupling reaction. Do I have any chemists in here just to start off with? No. OK, so let me break that down. I spent several years designing catalysts that would make a carbon-carbon bond between two benzene rings. So I was just trying to make a single bond. And so I worked for Professor Alan Cowley, who is the main group king, and also um, Professor Simon Humphrey. And after I graduated with a PhD in inorganic chemistry, I actually got married. That's my husband. So three weeks later, we don't have babies, but I have dogs. So those are my puppies, just to kind of give you an idea of who I am. All right, so after I graduated from um, uh, University of Texas, I became a general chemistry instructor here at UT, which has been one of my favorite things in the entire world. So I've officially been here for four years, and it's been the best four years of my life. But what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the difference between what the classroom was like when I was there and possibly like what you maybe experienced if you ever had to take a science class, and what's different between what we're doing now here at the university. So just to give you an overview of what we do, um, we have two semesters for general chemistry. The first semester, you take Gen Chem 1. The second semester, usually in the spring, you take Gen Chem 2. In the spring course, we also have a lab component partnered with that, and that's where the students get the hands-on learning or the evidence-based learning which is really important. But what we're trying to do right now, because the lab and the lecture are completely separated, is we want to do everything we possibly can to make sure that our students actually get the hands-on experience or the active learning inside of our classroom. So what I'm going to talk to you about for the next like five or six minutes or so is 
It's just how we actually do that here at UT. And so the first thing we expect our students to do is before they even step foot in our classroom, we expect them to do something. And so we consider this the hybrid format. Some people have referred to this as a flipped format for the classroom, but we actually call this the hybrid format. And so what that means is I expect my students to read something, watch a video, do some problems, something, before they even walk into my classroom. So for example, I want them to know what enthalpy is, what entropy is, what gives free energy is before they even step in, because we don't have time to do definitions anymore. If I sit up here and give you my back and write on the blackboard over and over and over again, what research is saying is that the millennials do not learn very well that way. And so what we have had to do is adapt to try to fix that and make sure that we have learning actually happening in our classroom. So when these students walk in, they in theory know all the definitions. They know that very, very base level um, education, the pedagogy aspect, and then they come right into my class and then we step on to the second part, the third part, the fourth part. So I talk to them how to do Hess's Law, how to use heats of formation, how to do all these calculations and we actually walk around. So I teach a class of 500 students and I'm going to show you in a second how I actually do that with me just one person. In the class, we use two different things. We use a course pack, so that's a hand-on piece, and then we use an iClicker cloud. So that's a way to check in with real and get real-time data. Like I said, 500 people and one of me. So let me kind of highlight this. So this is our course pack, and I'm so sorry, it's very small, so you probably can't see this, but what it is is a big binder, and there's four slides on each thing. And the one thing I want to highlight is at the very top it says the word question, and then there's questions right here, right, right in the course pack. So just to give you a frame of reference, on May 31st, my deadline for the fall course pack was, was May 31st. So I had to submit all of my slides, all of my activities, everything for May 31st for the class I'm going to be teaching up here in the fall. What's really particularly difficult about this is if I go back, if you can see on the front page, is we as the general chemistry team have decided to teach as a team. We no longer teach as a single person. So what that means is there's 10 different professors that are sitting here ready to answer questions for our students. We have up to 4,000 students who go through our general chemistry classes every single semester. So we We've decided to give the most to our students by opening up everybody for office hours. All of our TAs, all of our resources, every worksheet we've ever made, everything we share with each other. And we want to make sure that each student is getting the best learning experience here at this university. We also use this thing called iClicker, and that's just basically a remote where they can click in, and then right there during class in lecture, I can pop up the data and see, okay, 90% of my students said the answer is A, 10% said this, this, and this, and I can actually see how my students are doing right there in the moment, and I can tell immediately right there, yes, my students are with me, or no, they're not. Now, you might have noticed this, and I apologize, sir, this is coming out, but I used to be a fitness instructor, so I move around a lot, and I talk really fast, um, and that's how I was I, I'm able to kind of afford graduate school, and so so we had an 80% rule in class. I used to teach kickboxing classes. And so if 80% of your students were with you and they had the routine, so like step, step, punch, step, step, punch, if they were with you, then you would continue on. If 80% of your students are with you, you continue on. I use that exact same theory here with my general chemistry students. So when I pull up these, these bar graphs or the pie graphs or whatever it is to actually see how my students are doing with a per current question, if 80% of them get the right answer, then you move on. You don't waste class time for the 20%. It's 80%. So 20% come to office hours and you give them one-on-one -on -one tutoring or maybe one-on-four four, something like that. But it's a way to get the most out of the 75 minutes that were there. The last thing I want to talk to you about is sapling. I just want to show this to you because I told my parents about it and they freaked out. They didn't know this was possible. So just a, like a really quick little thing. Basically what sapling is is a homework system, but it's online. And what's really cool about this is they hire masters and PhD chemists to actually write these questions. So if these people write a question, more than one question in a single day, then they are not doing their job. So what I mean by that, this is a, just a sample question to give you kind of a visual. And so all of these numbers here are all algodes. So they're all algorithms. It's all randomized. So every single one of the 4,000 students, in theory, get a completely different number here. So A, that minimizes on cheating, but it also is fantastic because right before the students go and take an exam, they trade homework sets, and they have more and more problems, more exposure. But what's beautiful about this is these master and PhD chemists are going to look at these answers and say, OK, let's say the answer is supposed to be 12, and a student submits 24, right? So they're off by a factor of two. Right away, they're going to get real-time feedback immediately once they submit that answer from this master's or PhD person saying, hey, it looks like you forgot that there's two oxygen atoms or you forgot the water molecule or something. So right away, in their dorm at midnight or 4 a.m., whatever your students are doing homework, they get real-time feedback. And I just think it's a really incredible, beautiful tool. And they're local here in Austin, so I want to give them a shout out. Okay, guys. 
boring part's over. Thank you for staying with me. You guys are amazing. So I personally um, was raised by psychologists. My mom's a psychologist. My dad's a psychologist. My sister's a psychologist. I'm a chemist. Um, so something, something went wrong somewhere. But I did get raised by people who want to talk about their emotions and everything like that. And so the one thing that we always can agree on, always, is William James's theory of emotional memory. And so the theory of the emotional memory, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is basically something where it's saying if you have an emotional response to something, you're likely to remember it. So if you drove to work today and nothing happened and you just drove by, you're not going to make a memory. But if all of a sudden something happened, a fire happened here and then you had to drive over and you slam into a house, let's say it's a green house. You're likely to remember that it was a green house that you drove your car through, right? It's an emotional thing that happened. You're likely to cement yourself with a memory. So I personally use the theory of emotional memory in my classroom to try to force my students to actually remember enthalpy, remember enthalpy, remember combustion. That's my goal. Now, like I said, I'm a pyromaniac, so my favorite thing to do in the world is to play with fire. So whatever I can do to light myself on fire, my students on fire, that's considered a good day. <laughs> no, one of you. OK, there we go. <laughs> Um, so I personally believe that we have to set the tone of our classroom here at UT. It's one of these things we're going through a transition of, and it's really interesting to talk to different, uh, different professors and talk to their different perspectives of how they start their class. So for example, let me just kind of show you what I do. I'm in 500 different students here, and I'm dancing. Okay, so don't look at my moves, but this time look at the faces, especially right here. Hold on, let's see if we can get it. That's Farah. Farah took a class in the fall with a different instructor and hated it. Told me she would quit chemistry, was never gonna do it, wasn't going to be a doctor anymore, couldn't do it. Came into my classroom, I said, girl, I got you. Like, we can do this, we can do this. And over three months, she went from hating chemistry to loving chemistry. She had one of the highest grades in my class, unbelievably excelled, and it was so, so wonderful and rewarding for me. When I look back, I mean, obviously I'm embarrassed that I'm dancing here, don't get me wrong, but look at her face. Right? This is the beginning of class, of a chemistry class, right? Remember how much you hated your chemistry class? Bring that back to the front of your mind. This is what happens when they walk in. I throw music, I throw music, I play music, I throw candy at them. Um, if my students adopted a kitten over the weekend, I ask them how the kitten's going. Anything I can to remember their names and personal facts about them, that's what I do during the first three minutes before class even starts. So we are there setting the tone. I want them to know it's a safe place. They can ask me any question. I will never make fun of them. And if they have a question, I have an answer for them. And that's the most important thing in my personal opinion. Last thing I want to point out is something that I think is really incredible. So this is me this last semester I was teaching. I'm in the blue, so you can possibly see me. But the people here in the orange are my undergraduate learning assistants. And so these are students who did really, really well in my class in the fall and spring semester. So students who got A's in both classes. So what we do is recruit these students and we ask them to come help us out. So while I'm teaching for 500 students, I have up to 15 different undergrads who are circling my classroom at all times answering questions. Some people cannot teach that way. It's really, really distracting. You probably have picked up on for me right now that I'm kind of all over the place. That doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I think it makes it a better learning experience. So I really, really am fortunate that we have these undergraduate learning assistants that walk through the classroom. And then I just want to highlight these two. Like I said, I've only been here for four years. So that's Isha and Amanda. They were my first students, and then they've been PLAs with me for four years, and now they're graduating. Isha is going to be at the pharmacy school here. Amanda is going to be working for me in the fall. I'm super just like excited. It's my first four four years of cycle. I'm just so excited. This is such a fantastic university. I'm so glad I work here. OK. But as you can see, I have high energy. So just teaching wasn't enough for me. I got bored really, really quickly, and I needed something else. So I went to my chairman, and I said, please, please, please give me another project. Like, I'm sitting here going crazy. I need something. And so that is how Fun with Chemistry was born. And that's what I'm here to really show you guys in just a second. And so Fun with Chemistry is an outreach program. And what I do is I go out to local Austin schools, and I blow stuff up. And I really just try to show kids that science is fun and entertaining. And you don't have to be a dork or a nerd or a dude with a bow tie to, like, science. You can just be a girl who likes fire and dry ice and explosions. Yes? No? OK, yes. <laughs> That's my goal. And so every single year, we, act, we interact with a minimum of 20,000 students here in Austin. Um, as of last week, we hit 28,000, so it's my biggest year yet, so I'm super proud of that. Can we, like, please? Just, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Oh, you're so fantastic. Um, it's been an incredible year for me. This year, I was actually able to keynote at the Texas Science uh, Engineering Festival and also the USA uh, Science and Engineering Festival, so I was able to do a bunch of presentations for 3,000 students. Just been an incredible year. 
And the one thing I want to point out here is we have a day camp. So it's the one way we can generate funding for all of you who have ever had a job ever. You know that outreach is the first thing to get cut from the budget. So my program is so important to me that it's something I want to protect. So what we did is we had to get creative. We host a day camp every summer and that's a way to generate funds. And so now we are officially off the UT books so we can obviously forever and ever and ever have a fun with chemistry camp, hopefully. And then the last thing I want to tell you is just kind of show you a cool video so you can, what I've been talking about, this is kind of what happens. That's Julia here on the left. She's one of my undergrads. She's actually since graduated. And then right here on, excuse me, I said that backwards. Julia's on the right. Uh, my student over here is on the left. She's one of my favorite people in the world. And she fell in love with science here. Like we're literally watching this happen. Hold on one second. The favorite part is coming up. Hold on, hold on. Wait for it. Ah, did you see that? <laughs> Did you see that? She's like my favorite person in the entire world. So that was 30 seconds, 30 seconds, and about $6 worth of chemicals. Totally worth it, right? Like she's mine. She's come to my camp. I get her scholarships. I beg my own friends to give me money to make sure she can come to the day camp. Like that is my girl. And so we make sure we take care of our students here in Austin, but also our undergraduate students here. So it's all the way across the board. So my dream is to eventually have a pipeline from kindergarten all the way through career where I've somehow interacted with everybody and forced them to love chemistry. Maybe? No, okay. So last thing, this is really what I care about. My entire mission and my whole goal for my entire life is to tell you that anybody can be a scientist, literally anybody. It doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what your gender is, who you identify as, anything, the color of your skin, how much money your parents have, it doesn't freaking matter. Anybody can be a scientist as long as you have fire, you have Photoshop, like you can do anything you ever wanna do. Are we ready for demos? Yes, okay, wonderful. Thanks for listening to that. I had to do something um, before we got to the entertaining part. So, I have goggles and gloves, so if this is a crew that wants to help me with some demos, you are absolutely welcome to, so just kind of raise your hand when we go through these. But basically what I'm gonna do right now is show you a couple different demonstrations that I use in my classroom here at UT. Um, yes, I've set the fire alarm off once or twice, but we don't do that anymore, um, hopefully not today. But it's also what I do at Austin schools and everywhere across the country. So when I do my shows in Manhattan or LA, any place like that, these are demonstrations that I use. Now I know you guys know this, but I have to say it because I'm on camera. Um, so you have to have three pieces of safety equipment. So in order to do anything fun ever in science, you need to have goggles on, gloves on, and a lab coat. Yes? Yeah. Yes, okay, beautiful. All right, so now the first thing before I do anything else, can we please give it up for Jax who gave up his entire afternoon for me? <laughs> Woo, yeah, Jax. Jax has been volunteering with me for years and gave up his entire day today, well, afternoon for me today, came over here, set up stuff early for me, went back, we went back and forth, and then it was just incredible, so I have to shout out for Jax. Okay, enough talking, let's do something fun. So like I told you guys, I like fire. Ma'am, I hope you stay seated, okay? Do not jump up, I know it's in your nature, I can see it right now, but stay seated. All right, like I said, this is my favorite thing, do not do this at home, if you do, use cornstarch. <laughs> oh, I love that one. Oh, God, that's so fun. Okay, so who wants to do that? No, okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it one more time for you this way. Um, I can try to do it a little bigger. Looks like we don't have any issues with the smoke alarms here. Yay. <laughs> All right, you ready, ma'am? Coming for you. I doubt I'll hit you, but I'm going to try. Oh, I love that one. Okay, got to start with that one every time. So that is the fire breathing dragon. What I did is I put cornstarch in my mouth and I blew it over a tank. That's a combustion reaction. Anytime you have a combustion reaction, that's exothermic. So in the front row, you might have actually felt that heat a little bit. Pardon? What did you put in your mouth? Cornstarch. Cornstarch. Mm-hmm. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually, so I drink Diet Coke too, and one time I forgot to bring my water, and I took a sip of Diet Coke afterwards, and I don't know if you know this, but if you ever have Diet Coke and cornstarch, it looks like um, a volcano, so I basically had it shoot out of my mouth with, I mean, I had no control, so it just shot out. I looked like I had rabies, y'all. It was terrible. It was so bad, um, but it worked, so it was okay. <laughs> but it's, in all seriousness, if you decide to do this at home, practice with flour. Um, gentlemen, if you have facial hair, don't do it. Okay, just don't do it. 
<laughs> All right, so that's the first reason why I fell in love with chemistry. It's explosive, there's fire, it's fun, I love it. The second reason why I love chemistry is there's an element of magic, and so I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. So what I'm gonna do here is take three different solutions. They're clear and colorless, so they basically look like water, and I'm gonna show you what happens. If I pick this up here and hold it here, can you guys see this? Everyone see it here? Okay, beautiful. So the first one is four molar hydrogen peroxide, okay? At home, just so you know, you use, use about 5% hydrogen peroxide, but here we're gonna do four molar, make it nice and fancy. Second one, okay, again, clear and colorless. This has two different things in it. It has a little bit of sulfuric acid and it has a little bit of potassium iodate. So again, clear and colorless, nothing has happened. It just looks like water for those of you in the back. The last thing has three pieces in it, malonic acid, starch, and manganese sulfate. So in the front, you can see it turned about an amber color. Yeah, right? Magic. No, it's science. Okay. So here. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Okay, so what happened is we had three things that were clear and colorless. They started off looking like water. When we added the third one, it immediately turned to that beautiful amber color, right? The amber one. And then we gave it maybe, what, three, four, five seconds, and then it beautifully turned into that cool. Isn't that beautiful? Have you guys seen this before? Yes, okay, good, all right. So that one is called the oscillating clock, and I'm going to let it keep going for about 10 minutes, just for those of you in the front who wanna keep watching it, because I think it's really cool. But just basically what's going on is it's a really, really complicated uh, science or mechanism going on there, and depending on which chemist you talk to, they're gonna give you a different explanation of what's going on. So I'm gonna tell you my personal version. But basically what we have is A plus B gives us C. As soon as C is formed, it's like, whoa, 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 D is sitting here in the flask. So C reacts with D to form B. Well, B is like, wait, 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 there's A sitting here? So then B reacts with A to form C, which reacts with D to form B. And so you have two competing mechanisms. You have one thing happening, then another one, and it's basically this beautiful figure eight. Did you like that one? Yeah. Yes, okay, good. So now, changing it again. Let me give this to you, Jax, thank you. This one was, again, a favorite one. Okay, this is an old demonstration, but it's new to me, okay? This last summer, so I've been doing it for about a year, this last summer I actually figured out how to do it, and I've been obsessed with it ever since. And what's cool about it is you can eat it. <laughs> so this first part right here is calcium chloride, 2% calcium chloride. For those of you who want to do this at home, you can buy it on Amazon.com, it's $7, okay? The next one here is 2% sodium alginate, but I obviously did, uh, dyed it, so we have two different solutions here that are ready. One is green and one is orange, so here we go. I'm just squirting it into the calcium chloride, and then you have to count to five. So one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, okay. I like you, who's clapping over there? Someone's, you're my girl, someone. All right, gummy worms. This is how you make gummy worms. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? Or, thank you, yeah, you're my girl too. Okay, there we go. So, um, have you ever been to like a really fancy cocktail place and you have a martini and they give you something that's gooey in the inside like an olive but it's not an olive? That's this. This is exactly how they make that. They take sodium alginate here and they combine it with calcium chloride. So what's cool about this is that alginate is extracted from algae or black seaweed, right? So it tastes disgusting. But what they do then is instead of dissolving the sodium alginate in water, you can dissolve it in something else. So for me, when I do this personally, I want somebody to eat it. I dissolve it in a watermelon puree, then put my sodium alginate in my watermelon puree, then add it together. So it actually tastes like watermelon instead of gross seaweed. Cool, right? But when I first was trying to do this, I was like, oh, this is gonna be so cool. I'll make my friends martinis and I'll make an olive in there. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna be the best cocktail hostess ever. No, it's really, really hard. So if you ever get a martini that has one of these goofy little things in there, you should just like blow the chef kisses and be like, thank you so much. I don't know how you do that. It's incredible. Last science piece, okay, last science piece. What this is is basically an ion exchange. And so the alginate has two pieces. So there's one right here that's a negative and one right here that's a negative, okay? And so right now, each negative is holding on to a sodium. So there's a sodium over here and a sodium over here. But what happens is when we combine it and now the alginate can hook up with a calcium, it drops the sodium. So instead of holding two sodiums, it now holds on to one calcium. So a one-to-one -one ion, one-to-one, -one, now it's a two-to-one, which makes that beautiful long polymer. Does that kind of make sense? 
Awesome, okay, good. Now do you see why I'm a good teacher? Yeah, 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 okay, there you go, beautiful. All right, let's move on. The next thing I wanna tell you is why I absolutely love using demonstrations in my classroom. And hopefully you can kind of see this a little bit, but what I personally like to do is try to do everything with a fun way. And again, I'm fast and I talk quickly, so I apologize, but I like high energy. I want my students to have fun in my classroom. So, one of the first units that we do in general chemistry in the fall semester, so you have to think, I've had my students for about a week and a half, they are just learning how to do laundry, right? They're 18, they don't know how to do anything, they've stayed up way too late, they're all tired and they smell like beer, they're just gross at this point, right? <laughs> so you bring them back to chemistry, you've got to bring them back and remind them why they're here at this university. And so, okay, oh, let me grab that, thank you. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> no worries. So this is liquid nitrogen. Have we seen liquid nitrogen before? Yes, okay, beautiful. So for those of you who have not, we kinda, totally safe, don't panic. All right, I'm gonna get you, kinda coming to you, not so much. So liquid nitrogen is extraordinarily cold. It's 77 Kelvin or negative 194 Celsius. For those of you that is kind of, get, kind of getting to you, can you kind of feel that temperature a little bit or is it warm by now? Warm? If I stuck my hand in here, would that be a good idea? No, very bad idea, because room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, liquid nitrogen is about negative 200. So 25, negative 200. We don't do that, okay? But instead, we take these things. So this is a balloon animal, right? In my classroom, one of the first things I need to teach is something called Charles Law. And so Charles, Jack Charles is like a really cool guy. Um, and basically what he dis, dis, discovered, excuse me, is he discovered the relationship between volume and temperature. And so what I can do is get up here and be like, okay guys, here's what happens. When the temperature of something goes up, the volume of something's gonna go up. And the reason being is because the molecules actually start going really fast. And so the particles, go, the velocity goes back, which means actually the average kinetic energy is moving up, which means the collisions on the side of the wall is going up, right? Like crazy. Or I can go, Here's a balloon. I'm gonna put this in liquid nitrogen very slowly. All right, now quickly in your head, just make a prediction. Make a prediction what's gonna happen. Okay, three, two, and one. So the volume went down when the temperature went down. And now when this warms back up to room temperature, the volume goes up. Yay! So this is one of the very first demonstrations I do with my class. And they, I walk out with a balloon animal and they give me the same look you do, like, oh great, what is she gonna do with a balloon animal? No thank you. But you start messing around with this, right? And now they're listening to you, now they're intrigued because you probably did not expect that this is what was going to happen when you take it out, right? So now you start grabbing their attention. So the best thing you can do is do something a little bit different with the same concept. Thanks, Jax. Okay. Now what's gonna happen, right? So in your head, make a prediction. I might need Jax's help. Sometimes I can't get all the legs to cooperate with me. We shall see, okay? So I want you to just make a prediction, right? What's gonna happen here? So I'm putting the, the octopus in, right? Just like before. His head's a little big, so I'm not gonna be able to put it all the way in. But we'll go to about here. So three, two, and one. Ooh, okay. We'll just watch. So remember Charles Law, Jacques Charles, he's French. Volume and temperature is what he's trying to teach us. Oh God, that wasn't planned, sorry. <laughs> so now what are we seeing here? It's kind of, it's alive. It's alive. <laughs> yeah. Were you expecting that? No, okay, so now the question is why did it float? Anybody? Helium, I heard it, yes, helium. So I put helium in the head of the octopus. So all of a sudden my lecture just went from Jacques Charles or Charles Law to now talking about density. So why does helium float, right? And so you all know that our, uh, right here, our um, composition of air is 78% nitrogen, maybe 21% oxygen, and then the last 1% is your carbon dioxide, your argon, so on and so forth. So nitrogen, that's 28 grams per mole. Um, oxygen, 32 grams per mole. Water, 18 grams per mole. Argon, 40 grams per mole. Helium, four. So it's so tiny that as soon as it warms up, it's like whoop, and flies all the way up at the top because it's less dense than regular old air. Got it? 
So learning can be fun. That was the point of this demo. Learning can be fun. Yay. Okay, let's do another one, Jax. Let's do another one. Okay. So now, the next one is usually something that I like to show when I'm talking about anything that's boring and I need to spice up my classroom. So this is a demonstration. I can literally talk to you about anything. Now you're going to throw a topic at and I won't be able to do it. But usually I can find a reason to explain this and tie it into whatever it is I'm teaching in my classroom. So now personally, I just want to put this out there, that there's two different ways to decompose hydrogen peroxide. So this first one is my favorite one. I love this demonstration. So what we're going to do here is use an Erlenmeyer flask. And again, like I said, 30% hydrogen peroxide, H2O2 at home, we use about 5% peroxide. But here we're using 30. Now I'm going to add my catalyst to try to encourage the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. This is manganese trioxide. Okay. Just wait, just wait. It's thinking. Oh, oh, there it is. Isn't that awesome? I love it. I'm just like thinking, please don't have any smoke detectors right above me. <laughs> so this one is H2O2. Is someone coughing? Oh, I was like, what? Okay, this is H2O2, and we use the catalyst to split it apart. And so what I just did was release oxygen gas out the top. And if you can see here, maybe in the inside, I actually condensed liquid water here right on the inside of this beaker, or Erlenmeyer Fest, excuse me. If we were outside and I was not on campus where I'm employed, I would light that on fire and boom, we'd have a huge explosion. It's fantastic. <laughs> All right, Jax, I want to do another one. Let's do another one. Okay, so this one is very similar, right, but different. So what we just did here is we used manganese trioxide to decompose hydrogen peroxide. For this next one, we're going to use potassium iodide to decompose hydrogen peroxide. They're very different demonstrations, and for no reason at all, I'm just going to pull this tarp out. <laughs> just, I think it looks better here. <laughs> Need to fix the decorum. Stay there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now my personal favorite, like I said, was this one. We call that genie in a bottle, or in October during Halloween season, it's a ghost in a bottle, and so I usually do that in between blowing up a pumpkin or two. Um, actually, if you guys are ever here for Longhorn Halloween, you should check it out. I actually make pumpkins vomit. It's so cool. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so now this one. This one is called elephant's toothpaste. So again, I'm going to use my peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, 30%. The only difference is I'm just adding a little more. Then I'm going to add some dish soap. We use Dawn dish soap. There's no chemical reason to use Dawn dish soap, but penguins are my favorite animal, and they save penguins, so we support Dawn. And we need some food coloring. I have blue, yellow, green, or red. Any, any options, any choices? Red. I'm surprised you guys didn't say orange. No? <laughs> All right, red it is. <laughs> we can throw some yellow. Yeah, I'm doing it anyway. I'm glad you said it. OK, beautiful. Because red and blue would have been more purpley, right? So this will get it here. All right, and then Jax, if you don't mind, I want to give you a couple pieces here and trade out for the catalyst. And I also want to give you this. Is it hot? No, we're good. Okay. This is a little exothermic, so when we break that apart, it releases energy. OK, so now we're going to swoosh. I'm going to put this right here. This is potassium iodide. Yeah, we should be fine. Uh, I think we're OK. I hope so. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> yes! Oh, that's awesome. Isn't that great? <laughs> So I love this demonstration. It's so amazing. But personally, the first one is cooler. I don't know why or what's wrong with my brain, but I just love the genie one. But what about you guys? Do you like the elephant better? Yeah. yeah, it always wins. All of my colleagues, everybody picks this one. They think it's the best. But I love showing my students that you can use different catalysts or many different approaches to still get the same result, right? We still release oxygen gas. The only difference is this time it was trapped inside those bubbles. And then if you were able to move all the dish soap away, you would actually see that uh, liquid water condensing on the inside. Did you like that one? Are you guys ready for the grand finale? <laughs> I'm doing it anyway. OK, so. We have two finale things for you. Um, I was going to have two balloons, but on the way over here, I lost one. So you're just going to have to um, really like this one, OK? This is filled with hydrogen gas. Ma'am, it might be a little loud, OK? And again, don't dive forward. Don't know why you would, but don't do that. Actually, Jax, I'd rather use my blowtorch since we only have one. Right? Yes? Let me switch with you. It's OK. We're OK. 
And then you, ma'am, you're not coming any closer, right? Okay. <laughs> so this is hydrogen gas. Um, it is absolutely going to be a loud noise. So if you don't like loud noises, um, and actually, let me show you a little quick safety hearing. This, if you do this, it traps sound waves against your head. But if you give me elephant ears like that, it actually funnels them away from you. So I'm going to talk really quickly so you can put your hands up and hear the difference. I'll just keep talking. And then in about three seconds, I'm going to blow this up. Stay. Three, two, one. Did you get a good picture? OK, good. Good. So hydrogen gas, right? Now, if you remember at the very, very beginning, I used uh, cornstarch, which had a lot of carbon in there. When you burn something with carbon, you make carbon dioxide, and that leads to global warming, yada, yada, yada. Different lecture. We're not going to go there today. But what's beautiful is if we light something like hydrogen gas on fire, that only releases water, so there's no carbon component, no CO2. So hydrogen gas is actually a really beautiful source of fuel, and I hope it's the energy of our future. That being said, uh, would you want something like that, like a tank of that strapped to the back of your car? No, so we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're learning how to store it, but we're getting pretty close. All right, y'all, I have one more demonstration for you. Ma'am, you will want to move. <laughs> that I can say for sure. I'm going to do it right here, though, OK, so you can see it. And I'm going to pull this back. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you um, what I think is my favorite demonstration in the world. And this is called our thundercloud. Thank you, Jax. So what we have here is a bucket, which again has liquid nitrogen in it. We need more. Oh, good. Like, this is going to be bigger. This is our finale. Let me try to get this here. Again, liquid nitrogen, which is at about negative 200 degrees Celsius. And what we're going to do then is add some hot water to it, OK? But before I do that, I want to give you guys my information. Here's my email address, my personal website. If you want to know more about the crazy stuff I do or really big fire demos, if you want to see that, check it out. KateTheChemist.com. And for all of you that are on Instagram and Twitter, go to at FunWithChem for me. But thank you guys so much for your time. I really have had a great time here today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, let me finish with this big demo for you. Are you ready? Oh, hold on. Again with the tarp. OK, are you ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. All right. Oh, oh. What oh, the horns? Oh, not you. No, yes? No, you look sick. You, sir? How about you? You look nice. Anybody else? Anybody else? You, sir? OK, how about you? All right, y'all. Thank you guys so much.